snowy evening to the to the museum i'm richard hodges the williams director and this is the i think this is the fifth is it the fifth or the fourth in our in our great sites of the ancient world series uh, we've been to ur of the chaldees and bang chang in thailand last month we were at troy and tonight we're going to be in abydos in egypt uh, a site which is synonymous with many of the treasures that are in the museum. Tonight's speaker is Joe Wagner, who I suspect many of you know. He's the Associate Professor of Egyptian Archaeology here in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. He's also the Associate Curator of the Egyptian Section. Joe studied at this university, uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree and his PhD here, Working in, uh, working in Egyptology and working in particular on the sites of Saqqara and Abydos where he's been digging since the 19, early 1990s. He's written extensively on that site as well as with his colleague David Silverman on various other sites in the Middle Egyptian, Middle Kingdom, Egypt. And so it's a great pleasure and indeed for me something of a novelty because I haven't heard Joe speak about this but this site and that particular alluring photograph, I hope, will help us to forget the snow and think about the wonders of great sites in the world. Joe. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as part of the Great Sites series, uh, and I certainly hope the site of Abydos is as great as many of the other ones that you've already heard about. Uh, Richard, thanks for your kind introduction. Uh, the site of Abydos is a uh, really an extremely important site in the study of ancient Egypt. Uh, it's one of the longest lived uh, important ceremonial centers uh, in Egypt. It has its origins uh, way back in the distant past of the pre-dynastic or the prehistoric period. Uh, beginning roughly around 4000 BC, we can trace the development of uh, many of the roots of Egyptian civilization at the site of Abydos. Uh, and through most of the dynastic period, from roughly 3000 BC uh, through uh, into late antiquity, in fact, into the, the late Roman period, uh, Abydos was one of the, the central uh, ceremonial or religious centers of Egyptian civilization. Uh, it's uh, important to remember, in fact, that Egypt has its origins in prehistory, Abydos has its origins in prehistory, and in fact, it's one of uh, the very last, if not the last, places where the traditional gods of Egypt were worshipped uh, in late antiquity. Uh, so, uh, we're going to journey to this wonderful site, uh, away from taking you from our winter wonderland outside uh, to the sun-baked deserts of southern Egypt, uh, where is Abydos? Uh, it's located uh, in southern Egypt, uh, about 300 miles south of the modern city of Cairo, uh, or, oops, uh, that should be the right button, uh, just about 300 miles to the south of Memphis, uh, which is roughly where modern Cairo is located on the western side of the Nile River. Uh, we have this uh, desert bay. Uh, you can see the situation of ancient Abydos. Uh, it's situated along the edge of the, the Nile floodplain, uh, between the edge of the cultivation, uh, extending over the region that we call the low desert, the flat sort of undulating sands that lead up to the high desert cliffs, as you see in that slide on the left-hand side. Uh, here's a view of the sort of the environment of Abydos. Uh, it is a desert site. Uh, it is uh, a very sandy place. Uh, and for that reason, uh, Abydos is or has been uh, associated or uh, identified uh, in its modern name uh, as the buried Abydos. Um, you see here the different names that we uh, can use for Abydos. Uh, the modern uh, uh, name that we usually denote the site with is the uh, Greek version, Abydos, which is actually a derivation uh, upon the ancient Egyptian name for the site. The toponym for Abydos in Egyptian was Abju. And the modern name of the site is El Arab El Madfuna, uh, which means in Arabic the buried Abydos or the buried Araba. Uh, and this refers to the sort of uh, very sandy landscape. Uh, the uh, sand encumbered remains of Abydos extend over several square kilometers. Uh, and I should say that it's one of the most important, but in fact, in many respects, one of the least explored of the major Egyptian cities. 
uh, because of this uh, natural terrain that tends to encumber the ruins with uh, sort of a cloak or blanket of sand that covers it. Uh, so here you see the environment of it. Uh, it's situated in the southern end of this vast desert bay uh, and focused on, as you see in the upper part of the uh, satellite image there, uh, a desert valley that cuts out into the high desert cliffs. Uh, no one actually knows why the Egyptians called this place Abju. Um, I have my theory. Uh, and one of the interesting features of the site, uh, the topography, topography of the site, as you uh, kind of explore the terrain, the setting of this ancient ceremonial center. Uh, one of the very striking components of the landscape is this very prominent uh, kind of natural cliff formation, which kind of dominates the setting of Abydos. Uh, you see it there. Uh, and one of, the, one of the features of it, at least to my mind, is that it does kind of uh, resemble uh, a animal, a recumbent animal. Um, and one of the, the possible derivations of the name Abju, which became Abydos as we know it uh, through the Greek version, uh, is that uh, this, this could be translated as the mountain uh, of the elephant or elephant mountain. Uh, and to my mind, perhaps this uh, sort of tripartite uh, cliff formation looks almost as if you have a recumbent uh, quadruped with the rump here, uh, the midsection here, and the head here. Uh, and so uh, this image that you see here actually superimposes a very early Egyptian uh, rendition of an elephant body, uh, giving you the sense of um, perhaps how the cliff uh, gives the name uh, Abju or Elephant Mountain. Uh, it's a theory. Uh, I can't actually prove it. Um, uh, and, but otherwise, we don't really have any explanation for the ancient name. So those are the various names by which Abydos is known. Uh, okay, uh, I obviously hit the wrong one again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, uh, there we go. Uh, Abydos, uh, why is it a great center? Uh, why, it is a, why is it a great site? Uh, for many people, it has to do with this uh, thousands of years of development through which we can trace uh, the origins of Egyptian civilization and the development of it uh, through time into late antiquity. Uh, for other people, though, uh, Abydos is a great place uh, because of these uh, unfortunate hieroglyphs that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, these uh, damnable helicopters and spaceships uh, have become associated with Abydos in uh, the popular imagination. Uh, one of the great temples of ancient Abydos is uh, this magnificent building, the Temple of Seti I uh, of the 19th dynasty from Egypt's New Kingdom. Uh, this is the major tourist uh, monument that you'll visit if you uh, go to Abydos. It's argu arguably uh, the most beautiful temple in Egypt. When you walk into its in interior, you see the, the beautifully preserved painted uh, uh, re reliefs that decorate it. Uh, but on the outside of it, we do have these inscriptions, uh, which uh, over the course of time uh, and through perhaps the uh, the careful sort of defacing by someone, uh, a, a defacer of monuments, has altered these hieroglyphs uh, to resemble the form of a helicopter uh, that you see here, uh, what looks like a tank, according to this interpretation, and something like a, a submarine or a spaceship. Um, and it's quite amazing when you go onto the internet just how many websites actually are devoted to these enigmatic uh, spaceships and helicopters. Uh, for a lot of people, it proves that the ancient Egyptians invented flying machines and, of course, naturally had connections with extraterrestrials if they were able to do so. Uh, for Egyptologists, this is just rather infuriating because it uh, really takes away from the true interest of this magnificent monument of, of Seti, which is one of the great temples of ancient Abydos. Um, so we don't really uh, believe that uh, uh, has much to do with the greatness of Abydos. Why is it a great site? Um, ultimately, it comes down to uh, this very unassuming looking place. Uh, if you move out into the low desert, uh, beyond the fields, uh, out uh, towards the high desert cliffs, uh, you'll see here the entrance to that uh, desert valley that I pointed out just a little bit ago. Uh, right in front of this entrance to the high desert, you see these undulating mounds. Uh, uh, 
uh, mounds and depressions, uh, which are covered with millions upon millions of pottery vessels. Um, this is uh, one of the most important sites of early uh, Egypt. Um, this is a site known as Umm al Ghab in modern Arabic, uh, which means the mother of pots or the mother of broken pottery, uh, as you might want to translate it. And it comes from the fact that the whole surface of the site is littered with these million, millions upon millions of pottery vessels. Um, you can't actually appreciate this aspect of the site unless you walk over the surface. And uh, if you do so, you really do get a sense of the, the ground literally giving birth to pottery. Because uh, the pottery doesn't just litter the surface, but it's buried in huge, uh, deep uh, deposits. And if you just kind of walk around these mounds, uh, broken pots and sometimes whole pots will just come kind of falling out of the ground at you as if the ground is giving birth. Um, so literally the mother of pottery uh, is a quite uh, apt description of this particular place. Uh, um el Gab is the location of what you can think of as the first Valley of the Kings, uh, before the famous tombs of kings like Tutankhamun and Ramses the Great in Luxor, uh, way, way before that, um, thousands of years back, uh, Um el Gab uh, at Abydos was the first Valley of the Kings, literally the first necropolis uh, of Egypt's pharaohs. And that is kind of the basis for the significance of Abydos. Uh, its significance arises uh, way back uh, before the historical or dynastic period. Uh, in fact, in the period from roughly 4000 BC up to about 3000 BC, we can trace the development of Umm al Ghab as uh, sort of a family necropolis, a royal burial ground of powerful local uh, leaders uh, who seem to have been very instrumental uh, in the early formative period of Egyptian civilization. Uh, by the end of the pre-dynastic period, uh, from roughly 3,300 BC uh, up to the beginning of what we call Dynasty I, uh, a series of uh, sort of proto-pharaohs, uh, we're not in the historical periods at this point, but uh, tombs uh, obviously being used uh, to bury extremely powerful local leaders who have many of the uh, the, the features that we would associate with later kings, uh, they're being buried here. And they seem to be uh, uh, basically developing uh, Abydos as their royal burial ground. One of, one of the kings that was buried there is uh, a very famous one who's been identified tentatively as a king scorpion. And his tomb has probably become the most famous of the early uh, tombs, the, the pre-dynastic tombs of the sort of the precursors to Egypt's pharaohs. Uh, this is called Tomb UJ. Uh, it's a multi-chambered tomb which contains vast amounts of uh, funerary offerings. It had a burial chamber, which is at the upper uh, part of the slide there, that uh, the, the, the final kind of rectangular chamber. Uh, at the, the far end of the, the, the image that you see there. Uh, and it's also made famous because uh, this is the location uh, of the earliest uh, evidence for Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, you see these ivory tags or labels with perforated holes in them. Uh, these are the earliest examples of Egyptian hieroglyphs being used in a kind of administrative or record-keeping system attached to objects that were buried uh, in connection with this uh, proto-pharaoh's tomb. Um, the proto-pharaohs, however, uh, seem to have been the precursors to the actual kind of really pivotal kings that uh, brought Egypt into the historical or dynastic period. Uh, and this is really kind of the heart of ancient Abydos. Um, uh, continuing the development of its pre-dynastic cemeteries, uh, we have what we call the, the early dynastic uh, cemetery, uh, which includes a number of kind of mammoth underground uh, mud brick tombs that are cut down into the low desert. Uh, you can see one of them here, uh, which is the tomb of King Den of the first dynasty. Uh, gigantic burial chambers uh, that are cut down into the subsurface, surrounded by uh, chambers that were filled with uh, goods that accompanied the king in death. Uh, and also uh, surrounding uh, sacrificial burials, uh, people that for a brief period of time, uh, sacrifice uh, was being practiced uh, in the first dynasty, uh, retainers and other individuals who accompanied the early pharaohs. 
uh, in their burials at Umm al-Gab. Uh, so these are the, the these figures of the the, the first dynasty uh, from roughly around 3,000 BC to 2,800 BC. Uh, in, in approximate dates. Uh, these are kind of the, really the, the pivotal unifier figures of Egypt. Uh, these were the pharaohs that, uh, to the Egyptian mind, uh, unified their kingdom. They were the founders of Egyptian civilization, uh, and they are commemorated. Uh, their tombs are at Omel Gab, and they're also commemorated or recorded in one of the very significant discoveries that's been made uh, in recent decades. Uh, the German Institute in Egypt is, has been conducting excavations here for many years. Uh, one of their important discoveries were a series of necropolis seals, uh, seals of the actual royal cemetery that record the names and sequence of these early pharaohs. Uh, they include figures like the famous King Narmer, uh, who many of you may know from the Narmer palette. Uh, he is a king who's often connected with uh, the historical figure uh, named Menes uh, in Egyptian histories, they, uh, they recount that the unification of the two lands of Upper and Lower Egypt, the formation of the unified kingdom, is attributed to King Menes, uh, and Narmer has often been associated with him. Uh, his successor, um, there you see the Narmer palette, and Narmer's name which occurs on this necropolis seal. Uh, one of the other kings that succeeds him, uh, King Aha, uh, whose name is right here. Uh, his name means the fighter uh, or the, the valiant one. Uh, this particular pharaoh, according to, to later histories, was the actual founder of the city of Memphis, which becomes the, the major capital city in later dynasties. So these are really pivotal political figures. Uh, the first kings, uh, they were thought about uh, by later Egyptians as kind of the, the real establishers of their civilization. Um, and once, uh, once Abydos had uh, become the burial ground for the first pharaohs, that largely sealed its fate. Uh, what happened to it in later millennia uh, is associated with its symbolic relationship uh, to these founding pharaohs. Um, uh, and uh, at this, from, from, then, from this point onwards, uh, Abydos doesn't really have any kind of major political influence. Uh, it wasn't one of the, the great sort of populated cities of Egypt. It, uh, it doesn't seem to have evolved in kind, into kind of a, a major population center, uh, but it was always kind of at the heart of Egyptian ideas of the origin of their civilization and uh, develops this kind of ceremonial and religious role in later times, and that's a derivation of the, the fact that the first pharaohs are buried there. Uh, just to look at uh, some of the, the evidence from these tombs, uh, there's a lot of debate about what they looked like, um, but we do know that they were underground uh, burials. Uh, so the burial chambers of the first pharaohs were subterranean. Uh, they had some kind of superstructure, which is highly debated. Uh, the the above-ground features are not preserved. Uh, it may have taken, taken the form of kind of a low mound uh, or perhaps what, what we call a mastaba. Uh, we do know that these uh, places were marked and uh, designated uh, by the names of the actual kings that were buried there uh, by these wonderful stele uh, mar marker markers that have the name of the king, uh, which usually has the serach or the sort of an emblem uh, of the god Horus, the falcon god, uh, who is uh, sort of the divine emblem of the living king. Uh, these uh, markers were set up in front of or adjacent to the actual tombs. Um, some of you may be aware that we have a wonderful example of one of these up in the lower Egyptian gallery. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, we actually have one of the tomb stele uh, from King Ka'a, who's the, the final king of Dynasty I. Um, dating to around 2800 BC, in case you've never noticed it, um, if you make your way up to L Lower Egypt after the talk, uh, be sure to, to take a look at it. It looks very similar to these ones. Um, uh, Umm al-Gab was a very rich necropolis. Uh, the, the fragmentary remains that have been recovered, uh, both uh, 100 years ago, the famous excavator Flinders Petrie worked there. Uh, more recently, the work of the German Institute has produced uh, many wonderful finds. Uh, you can see the excavation of the largest of the tombs at Umm al-Gab, which is the tomb of King Khasa Kemwi, 
Uh, Casa Kemwe is uh, almost certainly the father of King Djoser, the famous builder of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. Um, and Casa Kemwe built this uh, mammoth underground tomb that was uh, seemingly equipped with just astounding quantities of uh, riches, uh, some of the fragments that were left by ancient tomb robbers, the bad stuff that they either dropped or didn't bother with. Uh, you can see in these uh, beautiful uh, stone vessels with uh, gold foil lids and seals still in place. Uh, we are, we're also lucky enough to have in the collection a number of examples of these and also in the, uh, the case, the early Egypt case, which is right adjacent to the stela of King Ka'a in Lower Egypt, uh, be sure to take a look in there. And there are some of the examples of uh, uh, both material from King Khasakemwi's tomb, uh, as well as some of the early labels, uh, like those from King, uh, the possible proto-King Scorpion uh, from tomb UJ. Uh, okay, so very richly equipped and beautiful tombs originally. Uh, these tombs are, are connected with uh, a number of uh, uh, enigmatic uh, enclosures which are located not directly adjacent to Um el Gab, uh, but removed at some distance, um, actually right at the very edge of the floodplain or the fields. Uh, we have these uh, monstrous mud brick enclosures. Um, these have been the focus of work uh, of uh, my colleague and uh, advisor David O'Connor, uh, who's been conducting work at the site uh, there since 1967. Uh, these are what we call funerary enclosures that seem to be associated with early uh, mortuary ceremonies uh, of these first kings. Uh, we believe that uh, there probably were final rites, uh, burial rites, that were conducted in these mud brick enclosures prior to the actual burial of the body of the king uh, out in the desert at Um el Gab. Uh, most of them haven't been preserved, but uh, there's one uh, kind of monstrous example of one of these, uh, which is the funerary enclosure of King Khasa Kemwi, the same king whose tomb you just saw. It actually matches the scale of his, uh, his underground tomb. Uh, it's currently being restored uh, as part of the, the work of the, the Pennsylvania Yale Institute of Fine Arts, NYU, expedition to Abydos. Um, no one's quite sure exactly how these were used, uh, but undoubtedly part of the ceremonial activities of these early pharaohs. Uh, and also connected with them are the, um, the somewhat famous uh, boat burials that were discovered in 1991. Um, this was actually my first uh, experience in Egypt. I uh, went, went out with David O'Connor to Abydos, and the first thing I worked on ever in Egypt were, was the site of these boats. Uh, and it did spoil me a little bit, I guess, um, the first season there to come upon the earliest examples of wooden boats in Egypt, these side-by-side uh, uh, burial structures in, in, inside of which internally uh, these contain the hulls of uh, very big uh, wooden boats that were probably part of this, the, the funerary ceremonies of these kings. Um, so, as I said, uh, my expectations are high every time I go out to Abydos. Um, and in fact, um, Abydos is a place that, that uh, doesn't disappoint um, because of the fact that you have these sort of concealing sands, uh, El Arab al Madfuna, as I, as I mentioned. Um, there are magnificent discoveries lurking uh, all around Abydos. Um, Okay, so uh, Um el Gab is the, the basis for Abydos and its importance as Egypt enters the, the dynastic or historical period. Um, and what's, what's interesting uh, about Abydos is really what, what happens after the period of the first pharaohs. The way the Egyptians thought about this uh, and continued to remember the fact that their earliest kings were buried there. Uh, what happened uh, essentially is that um, over time, um, I guess to, to quote a, a famous writer of fantasy literature, uh, history became legend and legend became myth. Um, within just a couple hundred years, uh, by the time you get to the Old Kingdom uh, and the reign of King Cheops, or Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid at Giza, uh, each, uh, the Egyptians had be begun to associate Abydos with one specific deity uh, who is uh, sh shown on the right here. Uh, this is the famous god of the netherworld, or the king of the afterlife, uh, the god Osiris. Um, uh, the Egyptians seem to have basically um, 
uh, sort of forgotten in a way over time uh, who these specific kings were um, who were uh, buried out at Umm el Gab. Um, it's a little debatable um, exactly how they thought about this, um, but one of the clear developments is that they began to believe that uh, the archetypal divine king, um, Osiris, uh, was in fact buried um, in the necropolis of the first pharaohs. Um, the reason they believe that is Osiris himself is in fact uh, symbolically uh, the uh, sort of divine notion of the idea of a, an ancient uh, pharaoh king, um, a, a, a god pharaoh who had actually um, gone through a process of death and treatment of his body uh, and then sort of rebirth into an afterlife existence. Um, and Abydos uh, becomes linked with Osiris probably through virtue of the fact that you have these very, very ancient kings of Egypt's uh, sort of uh, formative period um, and the sort of the religious lens that through which the Egyptians viewed this place uh, came to associate uh, Osiris uh, with Abydos. Uh, uh, Osiris is a really interesting figure um, and uh, it's important to recognize that for the Egyptians, uh, Osiris wasn't just a god, but he was in fact a historical being, um, a god king from the beginning of time, uh, and also a being who continued to exert uh, critical uh, kind of structuring influence on the cosmos um, and the, the nature of kind of the existence, uh, both uh, living and the afterlife that the Egyptians under, understood uh, or desired to participate in, um, Osiris is critical to that. Um, uh, the, the, the significance of Osiris is best understood through um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, exam a brief examination of the myth of Osiris. Um, and uh, many of you will probably be familiar with Osiris and his uh, sort of problematical family. Uh, Osiris is one of a, a number of four children who were born, according to Egyptian religious beliefs, uh, to the god Geb uh, and uh, his uh, wife, the sky goddess Nut. Um, and these four siblings that you see here, um, Osiris was the eldest of them. Um, they, uh, they composed uh, male and female pairs. Um, and according to the myth of Osiris, uh, uh, Os uh, Osiris was married to his sister, uh, the goddess Isis. Uh, you see her, the second one there, paired with Osiris. Uh, uh, Isis is a goddess who uh, is kind of the archetypal woman figure, uh, which you can actually see uh, through the fact that they name her the hieroglyph, uh, which shows a throne or a chair placed on top of her head, uh, is a writing for the ancient Egyptian word for woman. Um, she is the goddess woman. Um, so the, the archetypal woman is married to the archetypal god king, Osiris. Um, and Osiris, uh, according to the myth, um, ruled in sort of these, uh, these ancient utopian times when, when the gods uh, ruled over the world. Uh, but the myth of Osiris recounts the fact that uh, the brother of Osiris, uh, the infamous god Seth, uh, who you see here, uh, a mysterious figure uh, with a long pointy nose and these uh, ears that stick way up. Uh, no one's sure exactly what he is. Um, uh, a, a mythical animal of some form. Uh, some people have speculated that there may be some extinct Seth animal that's the basis for this, this creature. Um, whatever the case, uh, Seth is the jealous brother um, of Osiris and a little bit like the Cain and Abel story of, uh, of the Old Testament, uh, Seth uh, planned to murder Osiris and in fact did murder Osiris. Um, he uh, 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 fooled Osiris uh, into uh, kind of uh, laying down into in, in uh, a coffin or sarcophagus which had been uh, designed just to uh, to fit uh, perfectly the proportions of Osiris's body. Uh, he sealed it shut and he drowned his brother in the Nile um, at which point according to the myth Isis and her sister Nephthys, uh, this lady here, uh, the other the other member of this quartet of gods. Uh, she's the sister of Isis, uh, but also the, the wife of Seth. 
uh, these two women uh, then searched out the body of Osiris. They rediscovered it, and they hid it away from Seth. But Seth uh, found out about this uh, and actually uh, caused, uh, for a second time, the death of Osiris. He dismembered his brother's corpse, uh, shredding it into pieces. Um, and Isis and Nephthys uh, thereupon had to uh, find all the pieces of, of Osiris's body. Uh, and this is, according to Egyptian myths, um, Egyptian religious ideas, uh, this is the first event uh, of mummification. It's the origin of mummification. Uh, the myth of Osiris recounts the treatment of this dismembered divine uh, god-king, uh, the treatment of his body um, uh, in this moment after his second death. Uh, this occurs, according to the myth, uh, through the... Um, uh, the activities of the jackal god Anubis, uh, who you see in this slide, standing right behind Osiris. Uh, and um, the myth uh, does become quite elaborate and uh, has many kind of uh, juicy details to it that I don't have time to go into. Uh, but one of the interesting parts of it is that uh, in the process of searching out and recovering the dismembered body of Osiris, uh, Isis was able to recover all of the parts except for one critical uh, element. Um, there was one missing item. Um, the male member of Osiris uh, had never been, was, was not discovered. Uh, in fact, the myth tells us that uh, the, the penis of Osiris fell into the Nile where it was gobbled up by fish. Um, and the Egyptians, uh, in fact, uh, considered fish to be uh, the uncleanest of food. Uh, although they ate a lot of fish, uh, they believed that fish were unclean because of this uh, unfortunate uh, snack that they had. Um, and so Isis was forced uh, uh, to, uh, in fact, create uh, a prosthetic appendage. Uh, she fashioned a, a fake penis uh, out of clay and linen. Uh, and Osiris's uh, mummified corpse uh, had this attached to it. Uh, and here, in the kind of the final stages of Osiris's life on Earth, uh, occurred a divine moment, uh, the impregnation of Isis uh, upon the corpse of Osiris. Uh, you see this periodically in Egyptian temples and tomb relief. Uh, here you see in this scene, which is from the Seti Temple in Bidos, uh, the mummified body of Osiris uh, with Isis, who has taken the form of a falcon uh, hovering uh, over the erect penis of Osiris, um, impregnating herself on the body. Um, this is, as I say here, their, their final intimate moment, um, what the Egyptians would call um, uh, spending a happy hour together um, before Osiris went on his way. Um, it is critical, though, because uh, the impregnation of Isis allowed her to give birth to the heir of Osiris, the heir, Osiris's heir, uh, the god Horus, uh, who you see here in this group of three gods, the falcon god uh, Horus, who, like his mother, uh, takes the form of a falcon. He's the, the son of Osiris uh, in an Egyptian religious ideas. Um, Osiris is the incarnation of the dead king who's been mummified and gone into the tomb, whereas Horus is the incarnation or divine, um, uh, Horus is the divine uh, kind of model for the living king, uh, the exerciser of the throne of Egypt, um, the inheritor of Osiris. Uh, so this is, these are some of the basic aspects of the, the myth. Um, and uh, the, the myth of Osiris is uh, extremely critical to understanding ancient Abydos uh, because Osiris is uh, not just uh, the king of the netherworld, uh, but he is sort of the, the key to ancient Egyptian hopes for what will happen to them after they die. Um, the Egyptians were keenly aware uh, that life is short, but death is, death is eternal. Um, and uh, for them, uh, one of the keys to eternal salvation and the ability to have some kind of eternal, uh, endless or ongoing existence once you die uh, is rooted in the ideas associated with Osiris. Um, uh, for kings as well as common people throughout Egyptian history, uh, you want to associate yourself with Osiris and you often see these images of pharaohs 
uh, connecting themselves, uh, as you see with King Tut here, for example, with Osiris um, in the nether world. Um, Osiris, uh, when he died and uh, journeyed uh, into a nether world existence, uh, in fact, according to Egyptian myth, uh, became the lord of the afterlife. He's the pharaoh of the nether world, um, the goal of a lot of Egyptian uh, religion, uh, uh, whether it be uh, funerary texts like these, the coffin texts of the Middle Kingdom, or the famous Book of the Dead, uh, the goal is to enter the realm of Osiris and to associate with yourself with Osiris and to kind of mimic Osiris. Uh, what happened to him is the divine model for approaching and achieving an eternal existence. Um, so the Egyptians um, think of Osiris as a really kind of key uh, uh, individual, divine individual, uh, and uh, for as regards Abydos, uh, what's really interesting is that they, uh, by the time, uh, certainly of the Middle Kingdom, if not before, uh, they began to identify one of the specific tombs at Umm al -Gab as the actual tomb of Osiris himself. And this is the tomb of King Jer, who's one of the kings of the first dynasty. Uh, we know that his tomb was viewed as the tomb of Osiris because inside of it, um, they actually did sort of ancient archaeology where they excavated uh, the tomb of this ancient pharaoh and placed inside of it all sorts of votive objects. Uh, one of the most interesting is this uh, wonderful uh, stone uh, image, uh, three-dimensional rendition of the mummified body of Osiris, um, as uh, very similar to the, the, uh, the, the temple scene that you saw uh, from the, te the Seti temple, uh, where Osiris's mummy is laying on the, f the funerary bed, the mummification bed, and he's being visited here, as you can see, again, by Isis in the form of a falcon. Uh, certainly by the time of the Middle Kingdom, uh, the tomb of Jer was identified as the tomb of Osiris. And uh, at that time, uh, there developed a uh, important uh, religious festival, an annual procession, uh, which actually uh, started in a temple, uh, a main temple that had been built uh, in the ancient city or main town of Abydos that led out uh, through the desert to the necropolis of the first pharaohs. Um, and every year, there was this annual Osiris procession uh, that commemorated um, the myth of Osiris, uh, stages of the, the, uh, this festival actually reenacted kind of key, uh, key sections, uh, key events uh, in the whole myth of Osiris. Uh, we know quite a bit about it uh, beginning in the Middle Kingdom because uh, at that time, uh, one particular pharaoh, uh, who's the pharaoh uh, who's in fact closest to my heart, as you'll come to understand by the end of the lecture, uh, this dour looking king here on the left, um, Senwazret or Sesostris III, uh, he is a, a, a king of the 12th dynasty, uh, reigning uh, roughly about 1880 to 1840 BC, as you can see. Um, he took an unusual interest in the cult of Osiris. Uh, many, many kings had a lot of interest in it, but his uh, sort of uh, exceeded that. Uh, and he, he chose his uh, royal treasurer, one of the high officials of his court, sending him uh, down to Abydos with the instructions that he had to completely rebuild the temple of Osiris, uh, refurbish kind of the ritual equipment, uh, the statue of the god, uh, various uh, other ritual implements that were used in the worship of Osiris. And it's recounted in a wonderful stela, which is in Berlin, uh, the stela of Ichernofret. Uh, Ichernofret was the treasurer of uh, Senwazret III, uh, and he, you can see part of this here. My majesty commands you to go to Abydos to raise there a monument for my father Osiris and to complete his sacred image out of the gold which he ordered my majesty to bring back from Nubia in triumphant victory. Um, Senwazret III periodically campaigned in Nubia um, and returned uh, victoriously uh, with lots of uh, booty, including gold, uh, which went into the cult of Osiris. Um, Ichernofret, uh, in the stela, the main, the main interesting part of it, in, in fact, recounts uh, Ichernofret's participation in the sacred rituals of Osiris. Uh, part, of, uh, part of it talks about how he conducted the sacred, uh, what's called the Neshmet bark, uh, which is that divine bark uh, that you see 
uh, on the upper left there. Uh, this was a divine bark that contained a shrine inside of which uh, was an image of the god, uh, which would be conducted out uh, to uh, the, pr the presumed burial place of Osiris in the early dynastic necropolis at Um el Gab. Um, so he talks about in the, the, uh, the stela uh, how he, in fact, took part of this. Uh, and there are many, um, many parts, both of the stela and other uh, religious inscriptions, that allow us to reconstruct in quite a bit of detail uh, the, uh, that, the different uh, components of the ceremony, the annual ceremony uh, of Osiris. Uh, part of it, as you can see in this uh, quotation here, uh, included uh, sort of a reliving of the mourning of the passing of the ancient god king. Uh, one of the things that happened when he finally went into the netherworld, for, uh, journeyed off for the last time, uh, is that he was mourned uh, by Isis and Nephthys. Uh, the, these two goddesses became the sort of prototypical mourning women. Uh, and as part of the rituals, the annual procession of Osiris, there was a reliving or acting out of Isis and Nephthys mourning the passing of Osiris. Uh, so it was very, very elaborate. Uh, and uh, this annual festival became uh, one of the, the key points of, of ancient Abydos. Uh, but beyond that, in fact, um, sort of you know, not just annually, but year-round, um, Abydos evolves into a place where a lot of people desire uh, to tap into the uh, kind of the eternal symbolism of Osiris. Um, he becomes kind of the... Uh, the mechanism through which you can hope for eternal salvation and eternal existence. Uh, one of the things that you often see in funerary scenes is something that's called the voyage to Abydos. Uh, people uh, occasionally uh, did make uh, long-distance uh, trips to Abydos to visit uh, the site. In fact, all of those uh, uh, pottery vessels that you see littering the landscape of Umm al-Gab are the offering pottery uh, that, that were left by uh, ancient uh, pilgrims to the site, uh, but even people that couldn't go there would hope symbolically to take part in this. And uh, funerary scenes often incorporate what's called the voyage or journey to and from Abydos, where there's a, sh uh, a boat uh, that contains often a man and wife who will go to Abydos and take part in the rituals uh, of Osiris. Uh, many people, in fact, did, um, did do this, or uh, at least uh, in, uh, put in, into place uh, features that would allow them uh, to make this kind of eternal association with Osiris. Uh, one of the very important parts of the site uh, are a series of private, uh, so we, what we call cenotaphs, uh, symbolic uh, sort of ritual buildings uh, that are uh, clustered right adjacent to the temple, the ancient temple of Osiris, uh, and right next to the processional route uh, that connected the temple with the burial ground of Osiris. Uh, people hoped if they, uh, they established some kind of structure uh, in this location that they could tap into the magical potency of this place. Uh, these cenotaphs uh, were decorated or um, uh, uh, outfitted with uh, steely and statues that commemorated people uh, in sort of a, a mortuary setting. Um, most of them don't actually have burials connected with them. They're cenotaphs or symbolic structures. Uh, and so they link people eternally with Osiris. Um, Abydos became essentially a place where everybody, sort of the, the, the full kind of spectrum of Egyptian society, um, tried to connect themselves with the, the mortuary connotations of Osiris. Uh, the, the structures range from those tiny cenotaphs, as you just saw, uh, through grand temples, uh, like this magnificent uh, temple of Seti I. Um, here you see, uh, I know some of you in the audience have visited the place. Uh, in case you haven't, uh, the image there in the center just gives you a sense for the magnificent painted uh, relief which decorates this temple. It's a gigantic a uh, monument uh, dedicated to the veneration of Osiris, especially uh, in connection with a lot of other gods. Um, and uh, very explicit in the Seti temple um, is part of kind of the, the kingly interest in Abydos, uh, which is linking oneself uh, as the ruler of Egypt's present uh, with the past rulers of the country. One's, uh, one's divine ancestors, the kings of the past, going all the way back uh, to the first founder of the kingdom, uh, the 
first name that you see in this gigantic long list um, is King Menes. Um, King Menes, who I mentioned before, um, is symbolically thought of as the unifier of the kingdom. Uh, and in the Seti temple at Abydos, there's this wonderful chamber, in fact, well, it's a corridor or hall, in fact, uh, where we have this king list. Uh, and there's an image of Seti and his son, Ramses II, uh, venerating the divine ancestors. Uh, so all of, all of the kings that they thought were good kings, worthy kings, are commemorated here. Uh, a lot of kings that they didn't think think um, really deserved to be on the list were simply excised, left out. Um, so it's a sort of an annotated history of Egypt, um, but nevertheless a, um, a major king list and one of the, uh, one of the most extensive um, temple or ceremonial lists of pharaohs that we have from ancient Egypt. Um, the, the range of amazing structures at Abydos, um, including ones that one might, sus might never have suspected would, would be there, um, is quite, quite, quite significant. Um, right behind the Seti Temple is this wonderful monument called the Osirion, um, which is a subterranean structure. You can see the Seti Temple uh, uh, looming up sort of behind the back wall of it um, on the, the left slide there. Um, this subterranean structure called the Osirion is actually a symbolic uh, rendition of kind of archaic or ancient architecture that's meant to uh, symbolize the kind of setting that the Egyptians thought that Osiris might want to be associated with. It's actually aligned with uh, the burial place of the first pharaohs out at Um El Gab. Um, and it's a kind of religious uh, symbolic monument um, that again connects uh, the king with Osiris in death. Um, uh, many, many people um, uh, over the ages have been inspired by Ab Abydos, um, and they include some nowadays uh, famous figures. Uh, one person who sort of is irrevocably connected with Osiris and Abydos is this famous uh, lady on the left, uh, Um Seti. Uh, she was a rather uh, well eccentric English woman uh, who uh, was inspired um, f uh, at a fairly young age uh, 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 by um, basically by Egyptian uh, a visit to the British Museum, I believe. Um, in fact, uh, inspired her to. Um, sort of make sort of a mystical connection with ancient Egypt, and she moved to Abydos and lived uh, right next to the Seti Temple for many, many years. Um, and on the walls of the Seti Temple uh, are these reliefs that show the stages of the ancient temple ritual. And she used these as the basis for actually reconstructing the rites of temple worship. Um, she died in the 1980s, um, uh, but there's a whole host of uh, followers of Um Seti that most people don't know about, actually. Um, uh, in fact, several dozen people nowadays who uh, go to the temple of Osiris, uh, the, the Seti temple, um, and enact these uh, rituals. Uh, so this lady, for example, here on the right, um, who seems to have dropped her lunch, um, she's not actually just picking up her lunch, uh, but those are offerings uh, to Osiris. Uh, she's doing rituals inside one of the chambers. Um, so um, modern, uh, modern people who are inspired by the Osiris rituals and um, have tried to reenact them, uh, and they still come to the site uh, today. Um, all right, in the final part of the, the lecture, I want to um, turn away from um, the discussion of Osiris uh, and Abydos uh, and look specifically at uh, some of the features of my own research. Uh, king Senwazirat III, who I mentioned, my, uh, my favorite king, um, this dour-faced individual, uh, he is this pharaoh who uh, is notable for uh, having taken a specific kind of uh, elevated level of interest in the worship of Osiris. Um, Senwazirat III appears to be the first pharaoh of Egypt after the early dynastic kings who actually came back to Abydos for the purpose of burial. Uh, and we know that because to the south of the core of Abydos, uh, in this area here that we call South Abydos, we have the remains of a very extensive mortuary complex that was built by Senwazirat III, uh, which uh, has as its focus a subterranean tomb, uh, which is built up at the base of the cliffs in this location that you see here. Uh, and that tomb is the focal point for a very extensive complex uh, that includes a mortuary temple uh, down near the floodplain, which you can see in the 
process of excavation. Um, also connected with it is a large town site, a settlement, uh, which is located here along the desert edge, uh, which housed a significant population of people, probably at its height, several thousand people involved in the eternal uh, mortuary cult of uh, Senwazert III. Uh, Senwazert III built this uh, monument, mortuary monument complex uh, at South Abydos, probably uh, partially uh, out of his uh, specific interest in Osiris and uh, as an expression of uh, kind of new ideas about how the king uh, wants to kind of connect with Osiris uh, uh, in the attempt uh, to uh, gain kind of an eternal afterlife. Uh, we know that the place is specifically connected with the idea of the eternal existence of uh, the deceased King Senwazert III, because uh, it uh, actually has a, a wonderful name, um, which is also kind of a tongue twister. Um, in ancient Egyptian, uh, this place was called Wahsut Chakara Ma'acheru M. Abju, um, which uh, translates, as you can see there, uh, approximately as enduring or everlasting are the places of Chakaure. Um, Chakaure is one of the names of Senwazert III, true of voice in Abydos. Um, it establishes a place of eternal existence uh, for this king, uh, Senwazert III. Uh, we've been working there as, as part of the Pennsylvania Yale NYU expedition. Uh, I started work there in 1994, uh, and it's an ongoing uh, research uh, project, uh, which probably has no end. Uh, I probably will spend my entire career at this place. Uh, the sort of the uh, the quality of the archaeological remains there are. Uh, so extensive, um, and the site is so large, and the potential for new information is so great um, that uh, I envision being there for many decades yet to come. Uh, one of the features of the site that we've looked at is this uh, wonderful mortuary temple, which you see here in Reconstruction, uh, which was dedicated uh, to the the mortuary cult of this king, Senwazert III. Uh, it was named Beautiful as the Ka, spirit of the king. Uh, and the people that lived in the nearby town uh, were the population of administrators and priests and personnel that maintained this king's cult uh, uh, on the southern end of Abydos. Um, one of the, the major sources of information is this uh, beautifully preserved, um, for this period in time, uh, settlement site. Uh, it's a, pl a state planned or government planned uh, settlement, which you can see is composed of these blocks uh, of uh, many uh, sort of similar looking or similarly planned uh, houses, um, arrayed in uh, along kind of, a, kind of a rectilinear uh, urban plan. Uh, the major structure, the largest building, though, is a very exciting one uh, that we uh, first started working on in 1994 uh, and have almost completed. There are probably two more seasons' work uh, to complete the investigation of this building. Uh, it's uh, actually an ancient mayor's palace, um, a gigantic building uh, that uh, once was used as kind of the administrative center and also the personal uh, habitation, um, the house, in fact, uh, of the mayor, uh, and you, here you see some of the remains of this. Um, uh, I do like to remind people that um, these, uh, these remains at Abydos uh, come from roughly 2000 BC. Um, this is not Pompeii. Uh, this is not a place that was covered by uh, a, a volcanic ash. Uh, it's a place that suffered over uh, the last four millennia, uh, but nevertheless, for this particular period of time, uh, this is a very, very well-preserved building, and it's uh, giving us a lot of information on life in ancient Abydos. We're able to reconstruct a lot of the functions of the building, uh, which you can see here, parts of in reconstruction, and also kind of the local history uh, of this part of Abydos. Uh, it was run by a series of mayors uh, who are commemorated on inscribed objects and also clay seal impressions. Uh, these uh, impl impressions on clay, uh, you can see these hieroglyphs here, uh, are administrative seals that record the names and titles of a series of mayors. And we're able to reconstruct kind of the local history of the place. Um, and the mayor's house has given us wonderful insights into features of life uh, 4,000 years ago in Abydos, one of the completely unpredictable discoveries uh, is this uh, 
beautiful uh, decorated mud brick, uh, which is the only extant example uh, of an ancient birth brick. Uh, Egyptian women uh, would give, uh, when they uh, delivered children, uh, would do so uh, while squatting on top of a brick, as you see in this depiction uh, from later in time, in fact, from a, a Greco-Roman period temple, uh, but you would squat on top of these bricks, uh, and this uh, brick that we recovered from the mayor's house uh, is an actual birth brick that probably belongs to a set, uh, and it's decorated with uh, magical imagery, uh, a series of uh, gods and demons and creatures similar to uh, what you see on uh, these uh, sort of uh, famous uh, uh, objects, uh, well known to Egyptologists at least. Uh, magical wands or magical knives, uh, and we can study the imagery on this birth brick to reconstruct the, uh, the religious ideas of uh, birth and um, uh, 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 how the Egyptians tried to kind of tap into divine forces to beneficially influence uh, the outcome of uh, childbirth. Here's a reconstruction of the main scene on the birth brick, uh, which shows a, a new mother holding her baby and some incarnations of symbols that represent the presence of uh, the goddess Hathor, um, this bovine goddess here, and these female figures uh, who are probably, in fact, um, uh, trying to uh, represent themselves as incarnations of Hathor herself as part of the birth rituals, uh, very similar to what you see in this later scene where Hathor helps this lady. Um, these, uh, balanced Hathor figures are taking part in childbirth. Uh, so uh, the mayor's house is producing a lot of um, uh, interesting insight into uh, life uh, at this time period in Egypt, um, but um, one of the, the features of work in the mayor's house is that uh, there's an awful lot of material uh, that comes out of it. Um, in the last couple seasons, we've been uh, working on primarily study, uh, study and documentation of the small objects, a lot of its pottery. Um, and as we're doing that, uh, I decided that the time was right to um, go to uh, up to the cliffs and uh, undertake uh, a the beginnings of a lengthy process of excavating uh, the conceptual focus of this complex of Senwazret III, uh, which is this underground tomb, um, the subterranean tomb that you see here, uh, up at the base of the cliffs, um, is, is located inside of this uh, large T-shaped funerary enclosure. Um, uh, and uh, the tomb had actually been entered 100 years ago uh, by two uh, Egyptologists who discovered that uh, there's a gigantic uh, mortuary structure that extends uh, down about 100 feet below the desert surface uh, and then extending 800 feet uh, below the cliff that you see looming behind the site there. Uh, they discovered that the tomb had been robbed in ancient times and the place was just left uh, 100 years ago. Uh, uh, 1904 was the last time it was entered. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in uh, 2001 uh, and then especially in 2004, uh, we conducted work at the site uh, with the goal of reopening uh, and conducting an extensive uh, kind of scientific investigation uh, of this major tomb. Uh, one of the very uh, exciting discoveries that we made uh, is an ancient um, uh, a toponym, a place name, or a divine uh, designation that ties it in with the myth of Osiris that I talked about earlier. Um, we discovered that uh, the Egyptians viewed this place uh, as having a divine connection with uh, the god Anubis, the mummifier god, uh, and there's a, in fact, a necropolis seal, um, like the earlier necropolis seals of the first pharaohs, uh, that names Anubis Mountain. Um, this peak that soars up over the, the site of the tomb uh, probably is being connected with the mummifier god of Osiris, uh, who also has sort of protective, a protective role uh, in the royal burial. Um, and it's below this sacred mountain of Anubis that the tomb extends. Uh, here's what it looks like, um, uh, roughly 800 feet from its entrance to its inner uh, termination. Um, the, the kind of the inner half of it is directly below uh, the cliffs, uh, extending in a westerly direction. Um, why, why return to this site and um, 
excavate it. Um, uh, it appears to be a, a, a very uh, important and sort of pivotal um, royal mortuary monument, which, which helps to uh, decode uh, or understand um, questions of um, how the Egyptian tomb, the royal tomb, evolves over time. Um, and one of the important transformations um, that does happen is the abandonment of the traditional pyramid. Uh, many of you are familiar with the, the pyramids of Giza, uh, the pyramids of the early periods. Uh, at some point, the Egyptians place less emphasis on the existence of a a, 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 a superstructure above the tomb. Uh, the, this particular tomb at Abydos is the first royal tomb that abandons the built pyramid. In fact, it's a hidden tomb, a subterranean tomb, and what they seem to be doing is substituting an element of the landscape, this mountain of Anubis, in place of the built pyramid. Um, so we've been excavating this um, over the course of uh, three seasons now. Um, it, looked, it looked like this when we started excavation on the site um, in 100 years. It had completely filled in with sand. Uh, it took uh, about six months of excavation uh, just to get down to the bedrock, uh, which is the location uh, that you see here, um, into which uh, the entrance system into this underground tomb is constructed. Um, so it's a very difficult place to work. It involves a lot of labor, as you can see. Um, a couple of you in the audience, I think, may have uh, been part of the women's, the museum women's committee tour that visited us um, during the wonderful weather that we were having in May out in Abydos. Um, and a few of you actually were courageous enough to scamper down into the interior of the tomb. But here you see some of the work over the last few seasons. Um, and I'll just finish up um, the lecture taking a look at uh, what this, this excavation looks like. Um, uh, it's a quite amazing sight. Uh, the first thing that you think of when you, or uh, the first thing you think when you when you visit here is, um, good Lord, what were these people thinking? Um, this gigantic rock-cut structure uh, that goes down into the bedrock. Um, the whole thing uh, was full of debris and sand, and we've excavated it out over the last few seasons. <laughs> Um, it is a very fun place to visit, of course, um, and you see my wife Jennifer there uh, descending down uh, the sloping entrance passage that takes you down into the interior, and you'll notice, of course, the distinct similarity that she has in her, her mode of entrance to the tomb uh, with uh, Angelina Jolie there from the well-known movie. Um, Jennifer is sliding down into this magnificent underground uh, tomb, uh, 800 feet of architecture uh, that's not just rock cut, uh, but in fact much of the, uh, this tomb is lined with gigantic slabs of masonry, uh, granite quartzite and limestone that had to be brought from hundreds of miles away uh, and brought down into this uh, very cumbersome kind of entrance system uh, that takes you 100 feet below the desert surface. Uh, so just a few, a few shots of uh, the last season. Uh, one of the things you encounter when you enter the tomb of Senwazir III are the guardians, of course. Uh, the netherworld has guardians, and you have to pass by the gatekeepers. Uh, so here they are. Um, uh, this is part of the excavation work on the first chamber, um, which you see behind you, behind these guys, uh, this uh, beautifully uh, decorated, um, or the ceiling carved to simulate uh, wooden poles or uh, logs running across the width of the chamber, um, all constructed out of limestone masonry that's fitted inside of the rock cut uh, cavity of the tomb. Uh, this is the slide we started with. Um, the first chamber of the inside is this magnificent, uh, what we call the pole roof chamber, uh, which uh, you see in the process of excavation. Um, one of the exciting parts of this excavation is, uh, in fact, um, well, I, I usually tell people that I, I do prefer, uh, normally prefer kind of a, a bit more of a uh, sort of a, um, a, a subtle type of excavation um, a place where there's, you know, uh, a lot of detail in uh, small, thin levels of stratigraphy. Uh, but we don't have that in the tomb here. Uh, what we have is uh, gigantic chambers uh, filled with the debris of ancient tomb robbers um, and lots of uh, kind of wrecked blocking stones and massive 
uh, massive elements of masonry that had been dis dislodged by tomb robbers. Um, so it's a very uh, uh, sort of uh, different type of excavation to what we're doing in the town site, uh, but nevertheless uh, a pretty fun type of excavation as well. Um, the, the testosterone levels in this excavation are pretty high. Um, the air inside the tomb is basically saturated with testosterone. Uh, these, guys, uh, these guys just love this kind of work. Um, uh, I, I offered several times for, for these guys to go above ground um, and do some of the work that we're doing at the top, up, up top as well, but they had no interest. They'd rather remain down here and do the manly work, as they described it. Um, anyway, um, what we've achieved in, in terms of the work so far is the excavation of the first section of this magnificent monument. Um, at the end of the last season, we had completed the excavation of this pole roof chamber um, and two chambers that lead off uh, to either side of it. Um, there's just the entrance as it looked uh, last season. Um, and this beautiful architecture, which is a sort of an archaic style or invocation, evocation of uh, archaic uh, architecture that's associated probably with Osiris, another view of the entrance coming down into the tomb. Uh, some of the other chambers, uh, beautiful uh, vaulted chambers that are located adjacent to this pole roof chamber. Uh, bits and pieces of uh, material that indicates uh, uh, quite clearly um, that, in fact, this was a, a tomb that was used for the burial of the pharaoh, uh, including fragments of canopic, alabaster canopic jars that were used uh, for the burial of the inner organs of the king. And just to look at some of the, the inner parts of the tomb, uh, beyond the area that we've excavated so far, the tomb continues in a series of magnificent chambers, the central part of the tomb, that uh, connect through a, a sloping passageway with the burial chamber, uh, which contains uh, still today the sarcophagus and the canopic chest of Senwazirat III. Uh, gigantic blocking stones uh, that had been dislodged by ancient tomb robbers. Um, you can see this blocked passageway leading down uh, into the burial chamber, uh, which we actually have yet to excavate, uh, but there's Jennifer sitting in it. You can see it's very, very dirty. Uh, I don't know if a couple of you made it as far as this uh, when you visited uh, during the summer. Um, uh, unfortunately, St. Wazir III is not there. Um, you can climb inside of his sarcophagus and uh, the mummy is gone. Uh, tomb robbers stripped the place in antiquity, uh, but we're looking for any kind of shreds and bits of evidence that indicate uh, you know, the, the types of uh, furnishings that were associated with the original use of the tomb. And some uh, views of the inner end, um, the, the burial chamber of St. Wazir III. Um, uh, beyond it, uh, the tomb actually continues in a sort of a magnificent curving passageway that terminates in these gigantic chambers that tomb robbers uh, anciently ripped apart. Um, uh, these. Uh, final two chambers in the tomb were fitted with a huge blocks of red quartzite. Um, you can see the flooring of this uh, huge chamber here uh, that was actually tunneled into and the floor was pulled apart. Uh, this is one giant flooring block and these are two other ones that originally sat down together and the walls, you can just get a sense of the, the walls of this particular chamber. The place was ransacked uh, by ancient tomb robbers looking for treasure. Um, and so as we go through the excavation of this tomb, we're also looking for evidence for the process of robbery. Um, one of the really fascinating questions about this tomb uh, is its role uh, in the kind of the development of the royal tomb and how it relates to Abydos. Uh, and what seems to be the case here is that the king uh, at this time is thinking uh, very kind of critically about Osiris and his role in kind of the afterlife, uh, the eternal existence of the king. And as usually uh, happens in Egyptian religion, uh, things are quite complex. In fact, they're much more complex than they seem at first glance. Uh, and uh, Osiris is not sort of the, the be all end all of the afterlife. Osiris in Egyptian religion uh, is uh, sort of a, um, not just the god of the netherworld, but he's also the agent or the mechanism for one of the most important religious uh, uh, 
kind of processes that happens uh, in allowing the cosmos to continue. Um, and this is something that happens in the midpoint of the night, um, in the sixth hour of the night, according to ancient Egyptian texts, uh, occurs a mystical moment uh, when Osiris and the sun god merge, um, and there's this momentary kind of moment, uh, this regeneration, uh, where the power of Osiris and his ability to be reborn uh, is imbued upon the sun god. Uh, and this allows the sun, when it sets in the evening and goes in, in, in Egyptian conceptions under the world, it allows it to regenerate and, in fact, to be reborn uh, every morning uh, on the eastern horizon. This is one of the critical moments in Egyptian religious ideas. And um, for Egyptian pharaohs, it becomes the key moment that they want to participate in. Uh, and I believe, my theory is that the, this tomb at Abydos is the first kind of uh, fully articulated expression in architecture of the netherworld passage of the king uh, to participate in this moment of mystical union. Uh, and in the tomb, uh, in the midpoint of the tomb, we have this hidden sarcophagus chamber. Um, that you saw Jennifer sitting in the sarcophagus. Earlier, it may be an evocation of what the Egyptians call the at Imanet, uh, the hidden chamber of the union of Re and Osiris. Um, so um, at Abydos, uh, King Senwazit III may be coming there, a place that has a very long history, um, going back to the earliest pharaohs, uh, this association with Osiris, uh, but developing a new and sort of uh, innovative tomb uh, that is basically kind of a magical mechanism to allow him uh, to participate in this midpoint, uh, this moment of union of Ray and Osiris, uh, and to uh, be reborn eternally. So we can uh, we can uh, uh, look at the site and get get some impression of kind of the. Uh, the long-term memories of the past uh, that go back to the beginnings of Egyptian civilization, the first pharaohs uh, that certainly Senwazert III would have honored, uh, but also the religious lens that they view this place through, um, their interpretation of Abydos as the burial ground of Osiris, and thereby the place that kings can relate themselves to the, the netherworld symbolism of kingship and also the ability of Osiris to allow uh, the king to merge or associate with the sun god and undergo this cosmic rebirth, which is the basis for uh, his eternal existence in the afterlife. Uh, so memory and hope for the future um, are certainly uh, elements that carry through in, uh, in the way that Senawazir III is developing this site at Abydos. All right, so I, uh, that's uh, going to bring my lecture to a close. Uh, I thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to, if we have time, to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Wonderful talk. Could you, could you tell us why Abydos? Why you, you've shown us these marvelous monuments almost in the middle of the desert. Why there? Well, it goes, I mean, it goes back to the, the fact that the, the royal necropolis was situated there. Um, we believe that Abydos was, in origin, uh, part of a sort of a complex of sites. Uh, and originally, uh, it, back in the most ancient past, uh, there was a city called Thinus, which was the political capital of these earliest pharaohs before Memphis became the capital. Uh, and Abydos was the necropolis site for Thinus. Uh, no one's ever found Thinus. Uh, it's thought to have been along the Nile and is probably deeply buried under the alluvium. Um, but as, as Abydos developed as the royal cemetery, uh, it then uh, you know, evolves all of these key kind of religious connotations and you know, very very quickly, and as you go, and go into the early periods of Egypt, uh, it evolves these associations with Osiris, uh, which are certainly in place uh, by the time of the Old Kingdom. Um, you know, so the, the political past of the place is transfigured into a, a religious and symbolic presence, and you know, becomes, a, becomes a, a ceremonial and religious center 
through, you know, through the later millennia. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer your question. Okay. Can I thank Joe Wagner very much? It's been a wonderful talk.